Andrew says, does your intraday CVD, I don't know what CVD is, um, include or exclude um, the evening session? I'm going to pretend that he's, well, we'll let you follow up in the chat there. Okay, yeah, so you typically call that CD, uh, just cumulative delta. There is no other type of delta other than volume delta, you know, it's just so CD. Um, I have both, but I tend to lean on the full, um, in, including evening session. 90% of, of what I look at is, is, is that probably 95 plus percent is pretty much the full Globex uh, session delta. ACOS says, Hey, Merritt, how big can a NADRO trader actually get? If capital is not a limiting factor, what would keep me from trading 500 E-minis or more? Would it be psychology or something else? Um, you're, you're, <laughs> I think people don't realize, even in these conditions where there's what, 60, 70, 80, um, on the bid or the ask at any given price level right now in like the S&P, they don't realize that you can still trade a 1500 lot, right? Are you going to come in and say 1500 by market? No, you're not. Okay. You're going to start to use probably some algorithmic help. Um, you know, the whole kind of like with a tick stuff, icebergs, um, at least breaking it up in, you know, 25 lot increments or, you know, all kinds of things that there, there is to do. Most, most big traders trade one lots, right? In, in one lot at a time. Um, but there's just, people don't realize the liquidity that they're dealing with, especially in something like the S&P. It's, it's just so, so deep. Um, Size is, is just not really an issue. But of course, I mean, psychology becomes an issue. That's why I try to teach my students in a certain way is because I'm already thinking about their success in advance. I'm thinking about how can I train them today when they're on micros so that when they are ready to trade 10 lots right that's a probably most people on here haven't traded a 10 lot in the s p right i'm guessing um or maybe they have but they had no business doing it they should not have done that that was like a tilt thing um but like a, a, training yourself early on to be focused on let's say our values and 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 redefining what it means to win and the things that we work on in terms of building a right mental framework. Those are the things that all of a sudden allow you to start scaling your trading with ease rather than with as much psychological roadblocks as there will naturally be to trading bigger. I do think though, that at a certain point, um, Money becomes nothing. I don't know how else to put it. Um, money loses its meaning. Okay. So there's an initial phase where I think, oh my gosh, I was risking $200 a trade. Now, my goodness, um, you know, I'm trading for merit and, and I got a size bump and now I'm risking $500 a trade and it feels risky and I'm scared. And oh man, you know, if I have a three R losing day or something, that's $1,500. That's like bigger than what my biggest winning days used to look like. And now all of a sudden my equity curve looks like crap. You know what I mean? Like there's always that recency bias of scaling up when it comes to the dollars. But, and I think that early on, there's also, I think, I, I don't, I'm sure that there's been psycho psychology um, studies done on this, but at a certain point, you start to risk and make more money than 
let's say is meaningful to almost like your lifestyle, right? So before it's like, oh man, I'm down a thousand dollars today. That's a bad day, right? I sure could use that thousand dollars. I only have a twenty thousand dollar account. Um, I'm not going to spend more than a thousand dollars today with my lifestyle, right? But at a certain point, your trading starts to become bigger than your lifestyle. At least that's been my experience. Um, and the money starts to become just numbers and it doesn't really mean much. It's just still the same game. So I don't know. Those are some thoughts on um, number one, you can trade 500 lots in, in the S&P. It's really not a problem. Um, you're just going to want to get some help in that execution and doing so if you want to do it fast and more covertly than, hey, everyone, here's a 500 lot, all right? Or moving the market, you know, a point and a half by banging in with 500 without knowing that there's liquidity there to do that, right? In the current high vol, low liquidity environment. But back, back in normal times, there's 1,500 contracts at every price level in the S&P. In the not so distant, wait, not so recent past, distant future. I don't know how to say it. Not too long ago, a few years ago. What's up, Merrick? Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between your strategy, Nadro, and your tactics and how each of these components contribute to your edge? I certainly consider my... Um, tactics to be a component of nadro still right i don't really separate them right anything past really the n and the a are tactics in my opinion right i use dba i use rhythm i use order flow um there are some additional tactics right speed of the tape maybe relative volume um um other concepts that we already teach in terms of narrative, but like excess, lack of excess, AKA being able to identify where stop runs are likely, things like that are all little tactics, but they're really all covered in what is NADRO as a whole. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people have this opinion of me that I have all these skills and tactics and, and, and tools and different things that are like beyond the scope of NADRO. And I really disagree. I'm open to, I'm open to you guys disagreeing with me, disagreeing with that and us talking about that. Um, I'm sure I have blind spots just as much as anyone else. I've tried hard to think about my trading from an objective place and therefore teach like holistically what I do and see. Um, so, you know, I just really disagree that like there is a big disconnect between NADRO and the tactics that I use to, to execute. Um, yeah, all the way down to order flow and that being like a decision maker within the context of how strong the narrative is with whether or not, let's say, I'm going to scratch a trade and not take a loss, you know? Um, that's just experience putting it all together using the exact tools that I teach and whatnot. It's not that I have different tactics. It's just that I operate at a higher, more discretionary level with all those tactics and give myself more freedoms to like make exceptions and things like that. That's really what it comes down to. Um, the highest levels of NADRO trading are getting more and more skilled at understanding where it's appropriate to make certain compromises. I think that's really the highest levels of NADRO trading. Uh, Jamie says, do you review previous trading performance for prop desk offers? Uh, I, the door is always open for people who um, 
have a real track records and are interested in, in being on our team. We're always happy to have those conversations. Uh, Tanae says, speaking of AGM, will the May one start this week or next? I don't know. I do not know. Uh, get with Ryan on that. I He kind of manages <laughs> my schedule in that sense. And I'm sure there's an email buried somewhere where I agreed with him that that'd be a good start time. But I don't know. I don't remember. Do you ever trade while doing one of these? Absolutely. I have. Um, it's not common. So some, he, Jamie's saying, do you ever trade while you're doing this webinar? Yes, it, it's certainly happened. Um, it's certainly not happening right now. Um, a lot of times it's, oh crap, like I'm trying to get into a position, like I'm starting to stalk this trade and now I know I have to start this webinar. Um, and so I'm going to be talking to you guys as I look for like momentum turning points because all the other work's already been done, which is another topic of in itself I'll, I'll speak to briefly. A lot of people think you have to do all the work to put a trade on. And so let's talk about it from a NADRO perspective, right? They think they need to look at five higher time frame charts and under, start to read the narrative and, and then look at what the profile is doing and and where we're at on these timeframes and the dissonance and process that and rank and distill and look at, um, you know, the short-term tools and blah, blah, blah. Most all that work has already been done starting with like pre-market. I know where the best trade locations are for the session. I know what my hypos are like, you know, via, via, uh, or visa, via, however you say that, a, a DMI that I've put out. Like all that work's already done. And then it's pretty easy like DVA, I understand is like confusing to people at first, but a kindergartner can trade DVA. It's not confusing. And then it's just about like little momentum shifts and reading the tape. And I can do that while I talk to you guys. But again, it doesn't happen that often, just purely because I think a lot of times I'm less active in the afternoons. A lot of times I'm like nursing a core position that I'm already in or whatnot, um, which is not the case today. I was swing long yesterday. I was... I was swing long, uh, you know, up, you know, a couple five figures, you know, on on a trade yesterday when the snap news came out and gapped it down against me and took took my um my profits away there. Um, I I spoke to this a little bit with some some people internally, but I'll I'll tell you guys because I think it's a good teaching moment. Uh, my tweet yesterday after that gap down um, was immature, was, was, uh, was a weakness. It really was. Let's pull it up. What did I say? Newsflash. Snapchat doesn't know jack about the economy. Total knee-jerk reaction there by the indices. Let's say it in the chat. What am I really saying there in different words? What am I saying there? What's going on with me? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> All these things. You guys get it. I'm frustrated. This is BS, right? Um, this is stupid. This is wrong. Um, this is just bull crap, right? Like that, that's the sentiment there. Um, and so for me, that tweet was almost like writing in a journal, right? What you're feeling. Um, and so that was why I felt that it was important. And so, you know what, another thing that, and that, that drives me and motivates me that I find um, an energy source to do the right things, right? Is the fact that I am a role model for a lot of people. So for me, I can also, you know, it brings about almost a heightened self-awareness, right? I'm able to step back and, and view myself and say, what did you just do? What did you just say, right? What a trading action did you take? What words just came out of your mouth? 
is that what you teach, right? Is that the right way to behave and to carry yourself and to, to be mentally? And I recognize that immediately, right? That, what did I say? To the extent I was upset about that drop is to the extent I wasn't open to anything can happen. I wasn't detached from the outcome. I wasn't you know, strong enough there in my mental framework. It was kind of a moment of weakness and frustration. So look, we're all human. I'm not saying that like, it's not going to happen to me or not going to happen to you. Obviously it does, but here's the difference. Did I allow it to affect my actions? Did I double down? Did I, did I uh, get scared and exit, you know, out of process? No, right. I didn't do any of that. And so it's, it's, it's really important that that's why self-awareness is what I teach, you know, in, in, is one of the components required for good mental framework. The better, better you get at like being aware of those feelings objectively, neutrally as like a third party observer, the more that you can come in and say, hey, this isn't who I want to be here, right? This isn't who I am as a trader. This is just emotion. Um, let's get back to process and let's get back to a stronger mentality around randomness and outcomes and, and, and all the stuff that I teach on a daily basis. So anyways, I thought that was, uh, um, worth our time today on, on the conversation. So I'm glad that kind of popped up there. Uh, Lewis says, Hey, Merritt, I'm a hobbyist looking for knowledge and I use VWAP with a discretionary approach based on the auction process. And my question is, how do you approach the use of market profile in addition to VWAP? Sometimes I think to myself that they are the same. Well, you're, you're right that they are both versions of value, right? So let's pull up a, um, a note board, notepad here. Um, you know, you have market profile, which by the way, like as the day unfolds is developing, right? It's here. And then maybe let's see the rest of the day does something like this, right? And then values like here, right? So value started here and then it moved lower. Okay. Um, you know, I, I look at like, variance around VWAP and whatnot. So maybe VWAP was like this and, and maybe, you know, it, it, maybe it did the exact same thing, but typically not right there. Are, there are small differences. The biggest differences in my opinion show up, for example, let's say there's a big balance and then there's a breakdown. Well, guess what? Most market profile value is really going to maintain attachment up there where VWAP is going to really pour down, right? You're going to have something like that. And they're going to be very different. In fact, actually, I drew this wrong. That's not the way it happens in real life. Um, actually, the, the lagging side of VWAP tends to kind of, because it's expanding, it tends to kind of hang out up there. And then even if, let's say, on a different case, there wasn't balance, much balance up here, and we balanced in the afternoon, VWAP is still going to be lagging, right? You're going to have this value area with VWAP and you're going to have maybe market profile, which comes down and really starts to nail that balance and that value. So I teach the most important thing about anything relative to value areas is the fact that it is attached to balance. There is no value without balance, my friends. So if you can just take that simple concept and apply them, you're going you're gonna to do a good job, regardless of what tools you use. Um, but no, VWAP and, and market profile or volume profile are, are different animals. They, they're different calculations based on a different, essentially mean, right? Most traded price point of control versus the volume weighted average price. And then it's just a matter of like kind of approximating essentially, you know, standard deviations or whatever from, from there. Oh, uh, what stop loss do I use with this higher vol environment for ES? 15 ticks? It, it, it really depends on the trade. I mean, there's, there's plenty of trades that I'm taking in this environment where my stop is half that, right? Um, you know, pretty tight kind of stops where I'm, 
you know, let's say I'll short 39.25 and, and my stop will be at, you know, 39.27 or 39.27 quarter, or, you know, like things like that. So sometimes still eight to 10, but 15, I think is a pretty, a pretty like good guess of, of where my stop is, is a good bit of times in, in this type of environment you know, I'm currently operating off of a 3000 volume chart on the S and P um, for, for most of my timing of my entries and exits. But remember this, this is the point that came up when, when I, in my head, when I first read your question, don't use a fixed stop, right? Even if it adjusts to volatility, don't say, well, it's high vol. I use a 15 tick stop. Oh, it's low vol. I use a four tick stop, right? Um, take each trade on a case by case basis, and the the speed at which you're able to access a trade at a turning point um, is different for different moves, and the speed of the the, the shift in momentum for me. So that means my stop's going to be at different different distances, and I adjust my size appropriately to, to maintain a consistent risk from trade to trade. Uh, would you say it's a good rule of thumb to always scale out the initial third the same extent as the stop loss? So what I think Ryan is saying is what I would say um, in, in my words would be, do you think it's a good idea to always scale out? Let's say you get long here. Your stop is here. So this is what we call 1R, right? One unit of risk. He's saying should you always scale out a third at plus one R, right, of profit? And the answer is no. I mean, that that as a blanket statement to anyone without context of everything about their trading and what they're doing and what their results have looked like would just be um, irresponsible advice giving, like most trading books are, right? It's just blanket advice that guess what like it's it's like a golf swing right it's it's like even if i were to talk about your trading psychology for me i i've used this example before a very healthy mentality is hey man this trade is probably going to be a loser that's a great mentality for me why is that well that's because i tend to be too aggressive too confident uh too active right too caught up in maybe the the upside and not the downside, right? That was kind of where I came from as a as we call a natural human trader. So for me to say this trade's probably going to be a loser is like a great affirmation that hey, doesn't matter what the outcome is. My win percent is typically in the 40s. So it literally is probably going to be a loser. So just like get over this trade and, and the importance of it, right? That's a great mentality for me. Do you think that me telling someone who's afraid to pull the trigger and struggling to get into their best ideas, do you think me saying, hey, here's a great affirmation for you? I know you're struggling to get into these trades. But the thing you want to tell yourself as you're entering or before you enter is this trade's probably going to be a loser. <laughs> That's terrible advice. This person's never going to pull the trigger. They're going to quit trading. Um, so back to the question at hand here. Yes, I understand, Andrew. The purpose of this is to mitigate risk. You know, you had full one R of risk and you take, you know, one third of the position for plus one R. Right. So now you're risking minus one R on two thirds of the position that remains. Right. And so that's kind of your, your, your full, you, you've reduced your risk. Right. Um, you know, if your, if your R value was, you know, a hundred dollars, well, or uh, you just made, you know, $30 here and you're still risking, um, why do I not, why can I, is it $66? So then your, your actual risk remaining is um, $36. 
I think I did that right. I, I, you know, I, I don't get too deep into that as I'm, as I'm trading. So I may have done that math wrong, but the, the point remains like, that's kind of what he's saying. So, um, this could be a beautiful point to scale out, but what I want my guys to do is to use market generated information to make those decisions. Same goes Jamie for placing um, yeah, you are wrong. <laughs> uh, placing a stop at break even after you're up one R. Um, it, it, people do this as a psychological crutch. Okay, so let's get back to the question at hand from Andrew. This very well could be the best scale out you could possibly make, but it depends on the time frame, the the opportunity at hand, the overall risk reward landscape, um, and the processes that you've developed for for maximizing taking advantage of those, right? Your trading system. Um, the mar the what's the order flow during during that time, right? Maybe it's a discretionary like me methodology. Well, if the order flow sucks as we go up and it's one R, I might take off a third of the position. I might take off half the position. But if it's a really A plus narrative. And I'm loving that DMI and it's high confidence and then I got a clear read. I'm not taking off anything just because it's up, you know, one R or whatever. I may not scale until three R or something, you know? Um, and it's not because it's three R, it's because it's VWAP and now there's an order flow divergence. And that's a that's a normal sized rotation for the ebbs and the flows that we're seeing in this market. So why would I? expect more than as normal for the current conditions using market generated information to make those decisions is really the way to go and yes might you end up with a process that scales at one r you might but i want you not to do that from a okay i'm i'm now up what i risk in the trade so let's reduce you know like don't do it from that that's almost reverse engineering it do it from a place of this makes sense for my trading and my time frame and the and what I'm looking to do and market generate information and the tools that I use. Typically, people who do things, when I get to one R, when I get to this, do this with break even, do this with scaling out. That's typically what I refer to as discomfort avoidance. And discomfort avoidance makes you one of the worst participants in the market. I'm not saying you guys that are I'm talking to. I'm saying you as the, the generic population. If you avoid discomfort, you will be the worst trader, right? You will be the market, right? You will be buying highs and selling lows. That's, that's going to perfectly allow you to avoid discomfort. You're going to get top ticked. You're going to get stopped out at break even, and then the trade's going to go. Um are there ever times where I scratch a trade at break even? Absolutely. But again, it's because the market's telling me that's the thing to do based on hard right edge market generated information. I don't have a process to move it to break even. Sometimes my stops end up at break even because that's where the stop should now be as things have unfolded. I get that question probably more than, more than any other question. A lot of people... Um, have been taught to do these things. Um, and there'll be people who run mathematical models and say, look, it makes sense. Look, I can, I can lie with statistics too, okay? I can tell you that this will make you make more and lose less. And it's just not true because you can't curve fit it, right? Or I could, everyone can curve fit it. I can give you a trade management scheme that would have made the most money over the past two days, but is that's what's going to make the most money over the next two years, right? Trading is not about recent small sample size. Trading is more like a casino operates where you end up with a lot of wins and losses. But over the long run, you're capturing more of what you're trying to capture through your trade management. You're, you're allowing your edge to play out. Someone who is more scalper, who's trading straight up momentum, it may make sense to have some stops that trail tightly, some stops that end up around break even fairly quickly. 
That's the nature of that type of trading. Because if the momentum isn't there anymore, the trade's wrong, right? It's not working. Versus someone like me who's trying to trade more like, imagine like the key levels from the DMI and I'm trying to position them while timing them you know, effectively, not just like placing a limit order at the key level. That's not how I trade, right? I need to give trades a little more room to kind of come back to entry and then go again. And, and even after they've been in considerable profitability based on the tools that I use, when a market's rotational, it's rotational. And if it comes back to where I got in at the lower end of the rotational area, that doesn't mean anything. It just means that the market's persisting to be rotational as it was when I got in. So that's the next level is starting to understand what the condition is of a market and be able to understand whether this move back down to my entry price is meaningful or not meaningful. But someone who just moves their stop to break even after one R all the time, they're not doing that, right? A little too fixed, a little too static, a little too probably doing that for emotional uh, reasons. All right, everybody. Great session here. Great questions as always. I'm sorry we got a ton more, probably more questions left than we answered. So I apologize. Uh, if you show up next week, and you have a question that we didn't get to, make a note, say, hey, you know, this is a question I asked last week, we didn't get to mine. I'll try to look for those and maybe answer them first. Cheers. 